Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. Governments rule our lives, but quite a lot of us believe corporations do too. And just like we can ask questions about how the states are governed, we can ask similar questions about corporations. How ought they to run themselves? Whose interests should they take into account? What social responsibilities, if any, do they have? To help me think through these questions about corporate governance and the role of corporate institutions, I'm joined by Alexi Mercou. He's a professor of business, ethics, and society, and Institute for Economic Inquiry senior scholar at Crichton University's Hyder College of Business. Let me very briefly mention that Reimagining Liberty is a listener-supported show. If you enjoy these discussions and want to get early access to new episodes, you can become a supporter by heading to reimaginingliberty.com. And with that, let's get to my conversation with Alexi Marcou. I'm going to start our conversation, as I often do on this show, with what might be a stupid question, and that is, why should we care about corporate governance. And what I mean by that is how a family runs itself. We might care, we as society, as citizens, whatever, we might care about, you know, we don't want abuse happening in the family. We want it to be, you know, we want, we can be invested in healthy relationships and so on. But like the way that a family goes about its day-to-day life just doesn't seem to be something that should bother us one way or another. And similarly with a corporation, like is it matters if that corporation is defrauding its customers. We we might worry about if it's having, you know, deleterious effects on the world and so on. But like the internal processes by which a corporation makes decisions, why should why should any of us have an opinion on that or be studying it in the first place? Well, I think the short answer to that question is, I mean, I'm going to lean heavily on your reference to the day-to-day operation of a corporation. But I think the correct answer is we shouldn't care. (laughs) And if we care too much, that that is itself a problem. Uh, I think the reason why we should care about it when we should care about it is in the event of conflict among and between the actors within the corporation, the same way we need to care about it within the family, the same way we need to care about it within any cooperative enterprise that people are engaged in. And even then, we probably shouldn't care about it in the event of conflict, except insofar as the conflict gets submitted to a third party for some sort of resolution, right? So, I read corporate law to the extent that I can be said to know much about corporate law. I read corporate law as a set of conflict resolution norms that the law is going to recur to absent an explicit attempt by the people who created the corporation or created the cooperative venture to have those disputes settled differently. So in that sense, it's a little bit like contract law. Contract law fills the gaps in agreements when the parties to an agreement have a falling out and they can't, through renegotiation, settle it. So really, we shouldn't. I mean, I don't really want to know how my neighbors run their family, and I don't really care even how corporations whose shares of stock I own directly or indirectly through my my 403B plan operate unless there is a conflict in which, say, my interests are going to get arbitrated in some way. That's probably not a satisfying answer, and that's okay. I I guess one of the ways that this question arises is that unlike a family, uh, a family has a certain set of rules that it has to follow that so you can't but they they kind of map on to the way that people outside of the family are supposed to interact like i can't i'm not allowed to punch you in the face alexi but i'm also like not allowed to punch my kids in the face and i'm not you know but but with corporations we impose legally a lot more there are a lot more rules on how a corporation runs itself than how a family typically 
runs itself. And a lot of those shape the way that internal processes, the the role of the board, fiduciary duties, uh, how profits fit in, other considerations. And so does that does that make it different as far as the like why should we care question because we kind of have to care because we we as the citizens who are ultimately influencing the laws have imposed so much structure on these things? Well, so yeah, have we imposed structure? I mean, one way to understand the imposition of structure is in a very top-down sort of way, right? That we have a vision of the way the corporation is supposed to work, and we attempt through legislation, through court decisions and whatnot to make corporations fit that model. And I actually I don't think that that's what's going on. I, I think the, the the reason why there are, as you correctly observe, so many more rules governing the way corporations are governed. I mean, I recur to to conflict before. There have been enough conflicts that have spilled over into the court system and into the public that courts and others have had to pronounce on this. But it, it isn't as a result of having one vision of the way a well-functioning corporation works. Basically, in effect, courts and legislatures have been putting out fires as they occur. So I guess one way to say it is more fires have occurred in the corporation than in the family, although I imagine there's some people who would beg to differ on that. Maybe maybe it would be helpful to take a step back and ask another very basic question, which is there are lots of cooperative ventures that we are in. We might be members of a church. We could see a family as this. You and I might plan a camping trip together. Um, I My kids might have a lemonade stand outside, but none of those are corporations. So what is it, what is distinct about a corporation that both, I mean, potentially leads to all of these these rules and regulations, but then makes it the kind of thing that we care about in the way that we don't care about the running of the management of all these other cooperative ventures that all of us are constantly a part of? Well, with corporations, the big one is the limitation of legal liability to the assets of the corporation itself as against the assets of those who participate in the corporation or those who, and of course, this is a term that is fraught in corporate governance, those who, full scare quotes here, own the corporation, right? The limitation of legal liability creates opportunities for shirking, opportunities for externalizing costs, losses, uh, catastrophic events onto third parties. Right. If families had a very easy avenue for doing that, I have to imagine that family law would be as intricate as as corporate law is. If if in fact it is very intricate, that's actually something over which corporate law scholars disagree. Right. How prescriptive is corporate law? Why do we have? Why do corporations get that? Like, what's the advantage of giving them this this limited form of liability compared to all the other ventures we might enter into? Well, the biggest one is that it creates a favorable environment for investment and growth for a firm. Right? If if we were to say if we were to live in a world without for-profit corporate ventures, we would live in a world in which as a business venture attempted to grow, it would have to grow by taking on new partners, the way a law firm does. Right. Or I should say the way a law firm did before we came up with all of these quasi corporate ways of organizing law firms that, you, that used to be illegal. Uh, and so one thing is that if you think that there are benefits that we derive from having highly successful firms grow very largely, achieve economies of scale that yield uh, less expensive products and things like that, then that's the implicit bargain, right? Without the corporate form, we probably would not see things like national brands or international brands. We would not see products that are distributed around the world. We would not see products 
that are produced on such scale that the production costs become minuscule as compared to the initial costs of getting the thing started. So, so that, that really seems to be the bargain, right? Because limitation of liability, at least at, at least as a first cut at it, seems prima facie unfair, right? But if you say, well, wait a minute, it's prima facie unfair, but those of us who believe that we, at least in concept, could be unfairly treated by it, we, we get certain benefits from it that we otherwise would not. Uh, so there's basically, there's a big counterfactual at work here, right? What would the world be without corporations? Does that then complicate the question of the role of corporations in, I guess, the relationship between corporations and liberalism? Because the classical liberals or libertarians or like radical free market types are generally very opposed to regulations, um, opposed to government basically getting involved in the way that market entities conduct themselves outside of punishing the standard fraud and theft and that kind of thing. The same stuff that like you or I would be punished for if we engaged in that behavior. Um, but our friends on the left often will make the counter argument that no, the corporation is, is a government creation. This, this liability, this lack of liability that you just mentioned was explicitly carved out. You and I don't have that. Regular market actors don't have that. It's not a natural feature of a free market. It's rather a artificial construct that the state put on for the reasons that you just gave. Because it we we think we get benefits from having this thing exist. But then the fact that these things are state constructions from this this leftist perspective means that it's almost they they argue it's almost like incoherent then for radical free marketers to be like, don't regulate these things because they're already a regulatory construction. Yeah, so in that sense, it's a little bit like uh, intellectual property law, right? Copyrights, trademarks, and uh, and patents, right? The, these things are not these things are not the products of merely of cooperative interactions between interested parties, but they are creations of uh, of political authorities, right? So the question is, you know, how much of it is an ex nihilo creation? of of say a legislature right as against maybe it is a an avenue for relief of the bargaining costs that would be involved in trying to get all currently as well as future uh implicated parties in the creation of a limited liability venture so i mean you know one suggests that again it's just it's created from nothing another one says well people have tried through joint stock companies right through limited partnerships through 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 things like that to try to in some way put bounds on the liability of the participants in the venture as against the venture itself uh maybe all this is uh, if you were trying to defend it from being just an ex nihilo creation of, of the legislatures, you'd say it, it, it creates an easy way for the parties to complete a bargain that would otherwise be be made nearly impossible by the bargaining costs involved. So, you know, that, that would be a very Coasean way of trying to explain it, which would be very congenial to the classical liberals, the libertarians, the radical free market types you, you, you talked about before. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there is something dodgy about it. I mean, the the classical liberal circles that I ran in in the earliest days that I was involved in that late undergraduate, early, uh, you know, early graduate school were often people who thought that the corporation was a bit of a, a bit of a scam. Put over on us. I guess they would be described today as some species of left libertarian, right? So, so that idea that idea has never been offensive to me, right? <laughs> so that that's 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 yeah, that's probably not a satisfying answer either. But it's probably the best one I can give. See, I told you at the outset there are no satisfying answers here. That's satisfying answers tend to lead to less interesting discussions. So I am I am cool with it.
The big debate within corporate governance is between what's called shareholder and stakeholder models of of the firm, or it is a big debate. Um, can you what what do those mean? That's a really good question, right? So what what I take the shareholder model, and, and, and this is a term I always worry about. Because it seems to be a term that only only people who don't subscribe to whatever they are describing <laughs> they, they use it. So it's like, well, I'm not one of those people, but those people, right? Those people subscribe to the shareholder model. It's a little bit like uh, it's a little bit like I don't know cultural Marxist. You know, no one self identifies as a cultural Marxist, but anybody who doesn't like what someone else is doing will often identify it that way. That that's what's going on here. So w- what I take to be the important features of the so called shareholder model are are these. One is the idea that the shareholders, that is the equity holders of the corporation, are or are analogous to, in some relevant sense, the owners of the corporation. Now, as I think I mentioned before, that that's a hot button issue whenever anybody starts talking about who owns the corporation. So that's one. Uh, a second thing that's that's very important in that is that if the if the corporation is organized in the for profit firm, it seems to suggest that the board and the top management of the corporation, so organized, has to direct its activities toward the interests of those who hold the shares. It's thought that, well, they own the shares for a reason. The reason they own the shares is they're attempting to make money, right? And that, therefore, that creates a certain orientation for the firm. And, of course, the firm interacts in many ways with many different people. But the idea is that this colors the orientation of the firm in its interactions with non-shareholders. Now, so what does the stakeholder model Well, the stakeholder model is just the recognition of something I just said, which is that the firm interacts with many constituencies and not merely with its, full scare quotes, owners. And that fact, right, should be recognized in some way. So I I know that's very vague, and that's because I want to fill it in a certain way. So some people... Some people are really excited by something they call stakeholder management. And basically here the idea is we're not, we're not trying to say anything about how the firm is generally oriented. We're just saying that in order to achieve whatever the firm was founded to achieve, it has to be very mindful of, it has to be very attentive to its non-shareholding, non-owning stakeholders, right? And that just seems that just seems quite reasonable, right? You're, you're not going to achieve anything in a cooperative venture if you're not fundamentally cooperative, right? And in order to be cooperative with other people, you know, to be cooperative with your employees or be cooperative with your suppliers, etc., you have to be mindful to their interests, right? Things get more interesting when when stakeholderism, as I will call it, is applied to the governance of the corporation, right? Here the idea is, well, it's not just enough for directors and for officers to be mindful of and attentive to its non-shareholding constituencies. It also has to include those constituencies in some way in the governance of the corporation. So the most obvious model of this would be the German co-determination model, where it doesn't do this with respect to all stakeholders, but with respect to employees. Employees have hardwired into the company by way of German law representation on the board. They actually elect people to the board of, of directors, right? And then the third layer of this is something that gets talked about a lot very recently in the 21st century, which is stakeholder capitalism. And so this is the idea that, well, not only should we be managerially 
mindful of these non-shareholding constituencies of the firm. Not only should some or all non-shareholding constituencies have formal representation on the board, but that the law itself, the law that governs to be gloriously vague, interactions between the firm and society must itself reflect the stakeholder orientation. And so the stakeholder orientation might be reflected in the law by way of, for example, loosening the, uh, loosening the, 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 uh, the pressure that fiduciary care puts on management to maximize uh, returns for shareholders as against other things that the firm might do. For example, trying to increase employment stability for uh, employees, right? That maybe the law should reflect an idea that the corporation, rather than being a private agreement among and between its founders and those who later invest it, it should be understood itself as an element of public policy. Right. And so, so in other words, the corporation is actually a reflection of government as opposed to a reflection of, and this really gets back to your question about how this interacts with classical liberalism, a reflection of a cooperative scheme for mutual benefit that some people come together to recognize. Right. So, so th the question that always gets put up is where are we? Here. Are we too far in the stakeholder direction with respect to the law, with respect to governance practices, with respect to managerial practices, or are we not far enough? Right. So more interesting to me than how people self-identify shareholder, stakeholder in the corporate governance debate is what they think the problem is that calls for them to, going back to your very first question, right, right, why should we care? Right? Why do people care enough to self-identify as shareholder people or stakeholder people? What do they think the problem is? And even though people may cluster in identifying as shareholder or stakeholder people, right, they often don't cluster on what they understand the problem. To clarify, explain a bit more about how this, the fiduciary duty for profit maximization works because on the one hand as I'm thinking about this kind of concept trying to conceptualize this the the stakeholder could be understand understood as there are a range of interests out there that you know it, different groups that are interested in what a corporation does how it runs itself and so on who are who are impacted in one way or another by that corporation's activities and some of those are the investors who earn dividends on profits or you know if profits go up then they can potentially sell their shares for more money so the profits matter to them but there are all these other people the the you know if the company is clear cutting forests then the people who benefit from those forests etc there's there's lots of people outside the firm and so the law could say you have to care about and there therefore take certain actions in regard to these other groups. So it's it's a it's like a positive command of you know put workers on the board do x y and z for these other stakeholders. But the other way that it sounds like some of the stuff you said sounds like it works is more right now the law says you are required to basically only take this one group's interests into account, which is the the shareholders. Your your fiduciary duty required by law is to maximize profits, and and anything else you might do that doesn't that's not aimed at maximizing profits is therefore violating your fiduciary duty. Um, and and so it, the law is basically telling you not to care about the interests of anyone else. Is it, I guess, it, so it, the question is, would a shareholder, say maximizing kind of a, a stakeholder perspective, mean 
affirmatively requiring corporations to take certain actions in the interests of other shareholder or other stakeholders. Sorry, I keep messing up these. I wish they didn't both start with the same. You you are not alone. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Or is it that we should lift the requirement that corporations only focus on this one interest, profit maximization, and then free them up to kind of then do whatever they want? Okay, so so that's that's a really good question, and the answer once again will not be satisfying, right? You see both of these things in the literature propounding a stakeholder orientation, right? One strand of that literature suggests that the problem is, right, is the imperative to maximize profits, right? Lift the imperative and you get rid of the problem. The, the background thought is that, is that directors and officers of the corporation and the management they hire are, shall we say, naturally inclined toward a stakeholder orientation. And that it's just this, this legal creature, right, that says, well, no, when it comes down to it, everything has to be justified in terms of returns to shareholders, that that is the fly in the ointment. Right. So lift that and you get rid of everything else. There are others, however, again, clustering under the stakeholder banner who basically say, well, no, no, the problem is not merely, right, or is not only that, uh, not only that, uh, that managers are under this obligation and and we can debate how strong that obligation really is by way of the business judgment rule right it's not only that problem the problem is that they are so suffused with the ideology of shareholder returns that they actually need to be under some sort of affirmative obligation to serve shareholder interests over and above the way they are inclined to do so already to achieve the corporate objective. What's the business judgment rule? What is the business judgment rule? That's that itself is a fantastic question. Of course, I'm no lawyer. I I did I did a year of law school. I did the important one and decided that I decided that much as I enjoyed it, it was probably the single best educational experience of my life. I figured out because for the first time in my life, I was in proximity with people who had practiced law or knew people who had practiced law. I, I didn't grow up in those sorts of circles. Uh, I recognized I didn't want to practice. So I took leave of absence and I worked for a year and a half as a paralegal in a large corporate law firm. And that was really great. And so I ended up reading a lot about this. Why? Because in my capacity as a paralegal, right, we would deal with all sorts of cases and conflicts where this was implicated, right? So the, there, is a, there is, you will be wholly unsurprised to learn a disagreement among and between legal scholars and courts themselves about what the business judgment rule is. So one view of what the business judgment rule is, is it is a standard of care that gets applied to the directors and officers of corporations in the carrying out of their duties, right? And the business judgment rule, in effect, the way it has been, the way it has evolved in the courts, it pretty much says, if you make at least minimal efforts to try to achieve the corporate objective, and you don't engage in self-dealing, you're in the clear. Right. So if it's a standard of care, it's actually a very low bar to reach. But then there are other people, other judges, other people in the corporate law literature who say, no, understanding the business judgment rule as a standard of care applied to the directors and officers of corporations is a mistake. Instead, the business judgment rule is addressed to the judiciary. It's a standard of review. When derivative lawsuits brought by shareholders against the corporation come before the court, the question is, how much scrutiny should you apply to corporate decisions? And basically, the idea is, you know, as long as they tried to make money in the case of a for-profit corporation, and as long as they didn't self-deal, then decline to review it. 
basically say this is something going back to the family metaphor with which we began the discussion this is something that is best handled internally right <laughs> the the shareholders should either either work the communication channels of the corporation or alternatively just sell their stock take the money and invest in something that they find more congenial uh, to do. So whether we understand the business judgment rule as a standard of care or a standard of review is actually pretty crucial in understanding what, what we think is the problem surrounding, one, the imperative in for-profit firms to maximize returns for shareholders, and two, whether the business judgment rule exonerates, on the one hand, or merely declines to get involved in, on the other, uh, managerial or director and officer activity that some or many shareholders might be upset about. So let's imagine I'm the CEO of a firm, and I have this duty to my shareholders. It's a public traded firm. I have a duty to the shareholders to maximize profits. That seems like an awfully ambiguous command to me because it's not clear to me how what would count as aiming at maximizing profits versus necessarily not aiming at maximizing profits because there are so many potential variables. So one might be time horizons. I could seek to maximize profits tomorrow, but that might dramatically lower profits a year from now because I could just say I could sell off all of the business assets and that's going to raise a bundle of money, a ton of profits, but is going to then collapse the business. Um, or I could say, as lots of startups do, I'm going to operate at a loss for, you know, Amazon operated at a loss for a long Nine time. Years. Yeah. Nine and years. I, I remember all of the like Newsweek covers and whatnot as like, that were like, can Amazon ever turn a profit? You know, they like, and the answer turned out to be yes. But, but that was during those nine years that did not Potentially, you could make the argument they were not maximizing profits because they literally were at negative. Um, it it could also be, you know, the the argument about like go woke, go broke, right? Like sure. The, sure. Exactly. You know, the Barbie yes. movie seems to have demonstrated that you can be quite woke and do rather well. Um, but there are other corporations that have lost money because they undertook social justicey looking things. And so it's hard to know if taking social justice stands maximizes profits either in the short term or long term, and it can vary. Like all of these are just really hard variables. And and the same, and I could make for for tons of different business activities, I could make I could make an argument that that is in fact maximizing profits or as the potential to, and you could make an argument, no, I don't think it actually is. It's pursuing some other interest, but the behavior looks identical. Right. And that's uh, Jonathan Macy. Uh, he's a law professor at Yale, probably one of the most cited people in the corporate law literature. I mean, he's a big deal. I've learned a lot reading his articles over the years. Yeah, you know, he in effect says he, he has he has an article on Dodge v. Ford, which is the great Michigan Supreme Court case from which we get this idea that fiduciary care is is owed to shareholders. Uh, you know, one of the things that one of the conclusions that he comes to in the article is that he basically says that what the what corporate directors and officers need at the end of the day to satisfy this requirement to uh, to maximize returns for shareholders, what they need is a story, right? That, that is, they need to tell a reasonably coherent story, right? You know, we're in it for the long term, and here's why we think what we're doing is going to work in the long term. Note that the requirement is not an affirmative duty to achieve maximum profits, right? It is a duty to make a reasonable effort to do so, right? Outcomes are always going to be uncertain. 
So, so I really think at, at the end of the day, the short term, long term, and, and all of the other complications that people point to, I think are more of a problem in concept than they are in fact, because corporate directors and officers, they do communicate with the shareholders. There's an annual shareholders meeting, right? If you're, uh, if you were a shareholder in Berkshire Hathaway, run by my neighbor, uh, Warren Buffett. I live about five blocks from him in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, you get so much more than a shareholder meeting. You get a big ass, can we say that on the podcast? Uh, you, you, you get a really big shareholder letter that Warren Buffett spends a year putting together. And what he's basically doing is he's telling a story. Here's why Berkshire Hathaway is doing what it is doing. Right. If you share this vision, hang on to your shares. If you don't have shares, acquire some. If you don't share this vision, this is this is your opportunity to sell your shares or to avoid buying them in the first place. And I I, I think here th this is yet another place where I think the business judgment rule actually has some wisdom to it. Back when I was in graduate school, I started work on and never finished. It was not for a course. Uh, a paper that I was going to call the business judgment rule as a moral rule. And you know, what it really does, it says, look, tell your investors what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then let them decide whether they accept the vision or reject the vision and operate in the marketplace through either selling or buying shares. Uh, let them indicate whether they're on board with it or not. Does this mean then that as, as, conceptual models, shareholder capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, potentially collapse into each other? If if I could say, look, I'm going to go all in on what looks like shareholder capitalism, but I the story I'm going to write, I'm not going to write a story about that saying, and this is going to crater profits. Because no corporation is going to say, like, our job as a corporation, what I want to do as CEO is minimize profits. But I can tell a story that doing that, putting workers on the board, instituting DEI programs, caring about the environment, donating to various causes, all of that is going to increase our, like – favorability of our brand, it's going to bring good attention, it's, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's going to, and so that, that ultimately the difference between these models is just where the emphasis is in the story that you tell? Well, I, there is a strand in, I'm not going to speak to the, the legal literature on corporate governance, but in the business ethics literature in which I'm a minor participant, uh, there is a strand of thought that basically says that stakeholder orientation, right, that stakeholder governance, or even that stakeholder capitalism do, number one, the orientation towards profits and how to achieve it. You tend to be a shareholder person. Because what you do is you see the world this way. You say, well, shareholders have put some money at risk money that they can't get back except by selling their shares to someone else, right? And therefore, they are, to a degree, locked in to whatever the corporation decides to do, right? And, you, and the answer, oh, well, if you're not happy, just sell your shares. Well, if your worst fears are realized and the share price reflects you know, bad management, what that that's not much of a remedy at all. Also, I would add, it doesn't work in the case of in the case of closely held companies very much at all, because there's usually not a well developed market for ownership shares in these things. Right? On the other hand, right, there are people who think, and this this goes back to your question about the law imposing a duty to maximize returns on shareholders. There are other people who believe that the problem with corporate management today is that it doesn't have enough discretion. Right? That that the imperative to maximize returns so quells managerial decision making that we cannot get all of the benefits that would just be there with a more stakeholder-oriented uh, type of management, governance, 
or a public policy environment for business generally. So if you tend to think that managers are too constrained by an imperative to maximize uh returns for shareholders. You tend to fall in the stakeholder camp. So I actually think it's a big dispute about discretion. Is managerial discretion something good that we need more of, or is it something bad that it it may be a necessary evil, but let's have the least of it that we possibly can. So I think the models don't, in the end, converge, not necessarily because it, they will yield companies acting in radically different ways, but because again, your sense of the problem is is going to be very different depending upon whether you see managerial discretion as an opportunity uh, to do good or an opportunity for malfeasance. Where does Milton Friedman fit into this? Because my guess is for most of us who don't know the literature on on these topics. If we've heard anything, we've heard that Milton Friedman made it pretty clear that your job is to just maximize profits. Milton Friedman fits everywhere and nowhere. Let me explain. He fits everywhere because his 1970 New York Times magazine piece titled The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Its Profits. Right. Yeah. The title pretty much says everything that the public has intuited about Milton Friedman on corporate governance. Now, I have a paper uh, with my colleague Jonathan Drake of Creighton University's Hydra College of Business, where I am very happily employed. Thank you, Hydra College. Uh, we just read it at the Society for Business Ethics annual meeting. The paper is called Reading Friedman Liberally. Uh, first of all, we, we kind of, that's actually not a very good reading of Milton Friedman, right? Uh, you know, anybody who's done public intellectual work knows that, you know, when you publish an op-ed, it's not up to you very often uh, what title your op-ed flies under. It's usually up to a copy editor who's saying, what's the thing in here that's really going to grab people and make them read it, right? So, so there's that. Uh, Milton Friedman is very important here because he would fit in terms of my earlier discussion on discretion. He would fit into the managerial discretion is a problem to be overcome camp. That, that's where he is coming from. His worry is that what is flying under the heading of corporate social responsibility is a way for managers to shirk their responsibilities to shareholders, which Friedman sees, uh, contra to what a lot of people say about him, which Friedman sees as fundamentally contractual in, uh, in basis rather than a property basis. The question is not really so much whether or not shareholders own the firm. The question is, what are they promised in the probably implicit contract that they have with the firm? And so his thought is, well, you know, here's why people invest in for-profit firms. They do it in order to get money, which money they can use in turn to achieve their conception of the good however private or public that is. But the managers are basically appropriating those funds in order to pursue their own conception of the good. So he thinks that managerial discretion is a problem. And, you know, there there are two ways that that he gets at this. One is, of course, by talking about all of the ways in which corporate social responsibility initiatives may redound to the to the detriment of shareholders. But secondly, uh, he is also a thinker who mourns the decline of the ultra virus doctrine in law. The ultra virus doctrine is this view that a corporation must be constrained by its corporate purpose, right? That, that the idea that is in seeking articles of, of or, of incorporation from the state in which you're incorporated. You state a corporate purpose. You know, we're a for-profit firm. We're a not-for-profit firm, whatever, right? 
you're constrained by that. But one of the things that has happened in the law over the last 70, 80 years is courts have generally decided that if, if a firm is a- acting ultra virus, it's basically no harm, no foul. Right. And it goes back to the idea again, if you're not happy with what a firm whose ownership shares you own is doing, either work through the system to try to change the composition of the board of directors or just share, sell your stock. Right. So Friedman is really important, I think, for a number of reasons. He's not an important thinker in corporate governance in the academic literature on this at all. But of course, he's, he, he's, he's participating in, he's participating in the, in, in the more popular space, right? By, by writing op-eds, by giving interviews and things like that. And he's reflecting, however well or poorly, what's going on at his place of employment at the time, the University of Chicago in these fields, where people like uh, Jensen and Meckling are working out the agency theory of the firm, who basically take this shirking problem to be absolutely fundamental to understanding the problems of corporate governance. And he's reflecting, again, however well or poorly, what that literature is saying out into the world. Uh, One piece of... uh, one one very important piece of the puzzle with respect to Friedman and with respect to the debate generally that I think never really gets put out there so explicitly is that this is a debate by and large about existing firms, right? That is that firms that already exist in the corporate form, right? There's little to nothing in the law of business associations, in the law of corporations, that says you cannot set up a firm that is oriented toward a myriad of uh, stakeholder constituencies, that it's not oriented primarily toward uh, maximizing returns for shareholders. There's really very little stopping you from doing that. Again, that's a presumption of the law if the Articles of Incorporation, the bylaws, and so forth are silent. But if you put that stuff into the bylaws, it's no harm, no foul. So a question that we might have is, well, why why were we so concerned about what existing firms were doing? Or as my friend Lori Ryan, who runs the Corporate Governance Institute at San Diego State, always likes to say, if you want to run a firm that way, start one, right? So why are we so focused on existing firms? And I actually think this, uh, to drop yet another mid-20th century name, uh, this is down to John Kenneth Galbraith. He was the Harvard economist who was a very skilled participant in... uh, he was a very skilled public intellectual. He was probably better known as a public intellectual than as an academic intellectual. And in books like his 1952 book, American Capitalism, his 1967 book, The New Industrial State, he basically says that existing for-profit firms, the ones that populate the Dow Jones and the S&P 500, they are so large and they are so powerful and they are so financially mighty that they are in effect, they, they are unmoored to the market. They are almost unmoored to government. They are in effect like a power unto themselves. And the only way to ameliorate what ill society is to enlist them uh, by persuasion, if that's possible, by force, if that's necessary, to address themselves to these things. Right. Now, there are a number of things that we can point to in support of that hypothesis. There are some embarrassing counterexamples to it uh, as well. Uh, Galbraith's bete noir was General Motors. He just thought that General Motors ruled the world. And for anybody who know who knows that it began starting to be called Government Motors in 2009 when it got bailed out by the government, this idea is straightforwardly absurd. But of course, it may not be General Motors forever. Maybe, maybe it's Microsoft, the bet noir of the 90s, right? Maybe it's Google, the bet noir of the present. Maybe it's Apple, which kind of 
goes in and out of being a bet noir depending upon what we're talking about, right? If that's what's going on, this discussion makes a lot more sense. But if if we're impressed by the entrepreneurial renaissance that occurred, at least in American capitalism, between roughly 1980 and roughly 2020, in which most of the firms that compose you know, the heights of corporate success were founded, right? Then this notion that it's all about existing firms is absurd, right? So that probably doesn't tell you everything about Milton Friedman, but it tells you why he's important, and it tells you why we keep talking so much about firms that already exist, rather than firms that we could create to do the things that we want to do. I wonder too, and you're when you raised Galbraith's thesis, it, it made me think of this is how much of this, like there is the, there's the corporate law questions. There's the like business management questions. Uh, there's, there are all of these kinds of questions, but in, in the background of this, it feels like there's also, so in democracy, we want the powerful institutions of government to reflect our interests and values. And this is one of the reasons that the culture war can become as heated as it is, is because we we talk, we liberals talk about the value of like neutrality and, instit- and government institutions that just exist to protect rights, but people want, they want big, powerful things to represent their interests and values and get mad when they don't. And corporations... When we talk about corporations, we tend to only think of like the really big ones. There's lots of lots of little LLCs out there that no one thinks about. But when the term corporation means Google and Apple and General Motors for most people, and those are incredibly large institutions that have they don't have government power, but they have a lot of power or influence in our lives. And and it feels like a lot of times the arguments about the way that corporations should be run, how they should govern themselves, are analogous to the the culture war with government institutions of we just want these big things that are recognizable, these brands, these companies to reflect our values. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think that's right. And so part of the way this question interacts with classical liberalism in particular, and liberalism in general of whatever stripe, is over how these questions are going to be adjudicated. That is, are they are they private questions to be worked out on a corporation-by-corporation corporation basis, or are they public questions? that properly belong in the political sphere, right? And that basically it should be as the result of elections won or lost lost, or as a result of bills proposed in Congress and either passed or defeated, right, that these questions get adjudicated. And this is another place where Milton Friedman is, I think, horribly misread. Milton Friedman is read primarily as saying, all companies, all the time, should be maximizing profits 24-7. And I don't think a careful reading of him withstands that, and that's what the paper Drake and I are, are, are working on is talking about. But something that is deeper in his New York Times Magazine piece in Chapter 8 of his 1962 book, Capitalism and Freedom, and a number of other places where either in interviews or in writing, he says these things, is he is focused on settling this question liberally, right? Well, one of the things that he says is he says, if corporations are truly supposed to be oriented toward the general good, right, towards social responsibility and all the rest. He says, it is intolerable that their directors and officers are chosen in the way that they are. Why? Because they're elected only by a tiny fraction of the corporate constituents, right, the shareholders, and not by all of the people whose interests will be arbitrated by them. 
if they are supposed to be oriented toward these big questions, whether they are culture war, woke capitalism questions, whether they're taxing and spending questions or what have you, right? So part of an undercurrent in terms of the public understanding of Friedman, but I actually think the main story in Friedman, if you'll read beyond the title and a few choice quotes, is he's trying to say that as liberals of whatever stripe, we have to insist that these are public questions to be settled in the political sphere. And if corporations really are supposed to be attentive to all the interests that are out there that they might affect, then their directors and officers would have to be elected by the public at large. Now, don't misunderstand me. Friedman does not favor that as an outcome, and he would oppose it. If he were still with us, he would oppose it for square. But were that to be an outcome achieved via democratic processes in the political process, he would have to say as a liberal that it has a legitimacy that individual corporations on a case-by-case basis deciding what their social responsibility is and how they're going to reflect it, 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 that would be a much a much more legitimate outcome. What he really objects to is corporate directors and officers getting together with activists while shareholders are locked out of the room to figure out what the corporation is going to do. I call that Friedman's jurisdictional concern. So Friedman is read as being all about the fiduciary duty. I think the fiduciary duty is a comparative sideshow to his fundamentally liberal concern about jurisdiction. Where do these questions get adjudicated? In the boardroom or at the ballot box? And he would favor the ballot box. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you like the show and want to support it, head to reimaginingliberty.com to learn more. You'll get early access to all my essays, as well as be able to join the Reimagining Liberty Discord community and book club. That's reimaginingliberty.com, or look for the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon.